Jimbo Fisher had to follow a legend. And in 2010, you know, that's when he began his coaching stint with the Seminoles. And, you know, seven years into it, 78 wins, 17 losses. By the way, he's coached the national championship back in 2013. And that same year, Heisman Trophy winner in Jameis Winston. And the following year, 2014, guided the Seminoles to the first ever college football playoff. So when it comes to success, been there, done that for Jimbo Fisher. And this year's Seminole team is going to have a shot at getting to the playoff and maybe winning the whole thing because they're going to be loaded, ladies and gentlemen, with a lot of returning starters on defense and on offense, which is where we're going to start. They've got the starting quarterback returning and the sophomore in DeAndre Francois. Last year as a redshirt freshman, did terrific. Threw for 3,350 yards, 20 touchdowns, only seven picks. So biggest thing for him, can the offensive line protect him? We'll talk more about that later. Let's talk about the ground game because you do lose the most successful back in the history of the Seminoles in Dalvin Cook, a guy who had nearly 5,000 yards rushing in his career and a guy that had almost 1,800 yards rushing in 2016. But now he's in the NFL. It doesn't mean, though, the Florida State won't have a ground attack because there are several running backs in waiting, including the backup uh, for Cook last year in um, Jock West Patrick, now a junior, had 350 yards rushing, 5.7 a carry, and four touchdowns. But the guy that Florida State fans are really fired up about, the number one high school running back in the country last year, Cam Akers. That's right, Cam Akers out of uh, Clinton, Mississippi, led that school to its only state championship, a guy who had about a 5,000-yard rushing career in prep football. And now he's ready to show his talents on the next level and could very well at some point this season be the starting running back for the Seminoles. Cam Akers, the true freshman. Now, if there is an area that you might be a little bit concerned about if you're a Seminole fan on offense, it's wide receivers. They're just not very experienced in that area, and that included losing Travis Rudolph. So now it could be Nyquan Murray, who becomes FSU's number one target, had five TDs and almost 400 receptions in 2016. Six touchdowns and 25 catches is what Auden Tate had. Both Tate and Murray are juniors. And last year, as a freshman, Keith Gavin saw some um, decent playing time toward the end of the season, but made his biggest impact the final game of the year in the Orange Bowl in Miami when Gavin had that 65-yard kick return in the final seconds, which would set up Florida State for the game-winning touchdown. Now a sophomore in Keith Gavin. You have an offensive line who should be ready to play, and that includes the center and Alec Everly, a redshirt junior who has made 19 straight starts. Right guard, plenty of experience with Landon Dickerson, whom as a freshman last year started the first seven games, then was troubled with an ACL injury, but it looks like he's ready to go. Right tackle, Brock Rubel, a junior who made seven starts last year for his career, has had 13 starts total. At left tackle, this is going to be the wild card in Josh Ball, who will really have to do one heck of a job in protecting Francois, the quarterback. Um, obviously registered last year, but the year before, as a uh, high school senior, did play in the U.S. Army All-American game. And at uh, left guard, you've got Cole Minshew, sophomore. Last year as a freshman, started the last three games. And at tight end, Ryan Izzo, a junior, 19 catches a year ago, did have a touchdown and almost 230 yards of receiving. Good and bad news for Florida State if you're looking at a couple of stats. Good news is last year, when it came to the red zone, they were number one in the country as far as red zone offense. 57 trips inside their opponent's 20. Florida State scored every time except twice. That's right, 55 out of 57 scores in the red zone, 97%. And 44 of those 55 scores, 80% were touchdowns. Now that's efficiency. The Seminoles last year scored 35 points per contest. Pretty good. Bad news though, hopefully Francois, if you're a Florida State fan, doesn't get hit near as much because last year Florida State allowed 36 sacks. That's right, 36 sacks, almost three per game. That cannot happen again. Otherwise, Francois probably won't last this season at quarterback. And if that's the case, to quote Matthew Broderick in the movie War Games, Seminoles are going to be really screwed. Defensively, though, Florida State, when it came to sacks, man, they reigned supreme. Only one other team last year had more sacks than they did. The Seminoles 
second in the nation in sacks with 51. Now, you do lose to Marcus Walker, your terrific um, defensive lineman, got picked in the second round of this past spring's draft. But lots of experience remains there, and yes, lots of sack production is still on this roster. At defensive end, you got Brian Burns. Now, last year as a freshman, made the first All-American team. Easy to see why he had nine and a half sacks. The other defensive end, he can play too, and Josh Sweat, now a junior, uh, 10 starts a year ago, had seven sacks. Like I said, you know these guys were sack machines last year. Defensive tackles, Derek Noddy, now a senior, six sacks, started in 11 games, had 49 tackles to go with that. And running out the Florida State defensive line, Demarcus Christmas, who started in all 13 games and had 21 tackles, Christmas a junior. The linebackers definitely have quite a bit of um, statistics to brag about, including uh, Roderick Hoskins, a, a redshirt senior, who was one of the top tacklers on the team with 53 tackles. Matthew Thomas, redshirt senior, led the team in tackles with 77 of them and started in every game last year except for one. And running up the linebackers for the Seminoles, Jacob Pugh, now a senior, had four and a half sacks to go with his 43 tackles. So linebacker, a lot of experience. Now, as far as the secondary, you do lose um, Marquez White, the corner, got picked in the sixth round of the draft. But no worries because you've got plenty of talent. In fact, you get a guy back that you didn't have last year in the secondary, and that is Derwin James. He only played one game a year ago because of the um, knee injury, which derailed the rest of his season and happened in game number two. But the year before that, he racked up 91 tackles, made the freshman All-American team. A lot of people think that he can be a consensus All-American this year if he can stay healthy. So you've got one heck of a free safety in Derwin James, who will also, too, return punts. Strong safety. He's got experience as well. He's a returning starter. And Trey Marshall, a senior, 58 tackles, which is third on the team. And you're looking at the corners. You've got Tavarius McFadden, who last season led the Seminoles easily in INTs. He had eight of them, and he's now a junior. So you have to wonder if this year could be his last Mike Bolt for the NFL next year. Running out the Florida State secondary, the guy who has to replace uh, Marquez White, I'm talking about Kyle Myers, who last year as a freshman was a reserve. He played in all 13 games from now. He gets to start. Familiar name at place kicker. Of course, uh, Ricky um, Aguayo, whose older brother uh, was an All-American at Florida State. Well, last year, Ricky uh, made every kick inside of 40 yards. He was a perfect 12 for 12, but was a little shaky outside of 40 yards. Beyond 40, he was 7 of 14. And Logan Tyler, as a punter, well, we'll see if he can improve upon that 40-yard per punt average. Schedule for Florida State, well, the beginning of the season, yeah, you don't want to miss it. It's one of the more highly anticipated season openers in college football we've seen in a long time. Florida State already in the new coaches poll is ranked third in the country. Alabama's ranked number one. I think the loser of this game is not necessarily out of the playoff running so long as the loser doesn't get blown out. The winner, of course, has a tremendous leg up on their playoff resume. Third game of the year means business. The Seminoles will host a Miami team that defensively will be absolutely loaded. The Seminoles will get to play the thing at Tallahassee. And then looking on down the schedule, you see the matchup with Louisville October 21st. Louisville absolutely pasted the Seminoles, and that was a game in which pretty much, in my opinion, Lamar Jackson put his stamp on approval for the Heisman Trophy. But this year's game is at Dope Campbell Stadium. And rounding up the year, of course, the defending national champions, Clemson, November 11th, the Tigers, though, lost a lot of key playmakers. And at the end of the year, Florida Gators, of course, a very heated rivalry in the Sunshine State. Got to play them, though, at Gainesville. That's the final game of the regular season. Vegas has Florida State at 9.5 wins. Florida State, because they're going to be so stacked on defense because they get back uh, Derwin James, the free safety and because I think the ground game will still be fine despite the loss of Dalvin Cook, I look for FSU to win 11 games. I look for them to win the Atlantic Division. Of course, I'll have my college football playoff preview show at the end of August sometime. Probably August 30th is what I'm looking at. And that's when I'll have my predictions of the Power 5 Conference Championship games. But I'll tell you what, when it comes to the college football playoff and the ACC Championship Florida State will be one of those teams that definitely will have my attention. That's my look at the Seminoles. We'll catch you later.